Does your company need a boost getting employees to understand that safety is a personal responsibility? Does your company struggle with recordable injuries and lost time accidents? If that's you, give our friends at Wagner Industrial Training Systems a call today at 717-479-1052. Wagner Industrial Training Systems offers a variety of safety and continuous improvement services, including forklift certification and behavioral-based safety training topics that include lockout tagout, machine guarding, PPE, respirable crystalline silica, and countless other topics. Does your company require first aid, CPR, or AED training? Wagner Industrial Training Systems has licensed instructors to cover those topics as well. What would life be like for your family if something happened to you today at work? Give the guys at Wagner Industrial Training Systems a call at 717-479-1052. Also, you can check them out at Facebook at Wagner Industrial Training Systems. All of our Going Yard podcast listeners will get 10% off of their first class just by mentioning that you heard this ad. So call today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of the Going Yard podcast. And uh, I'm pretty excited for this one just because this is our first uh, episode, regular episode in, uh, in, a, in a little while, just because I feel like it's been such a busy week and we've had two wild card episodes jump up on you. We've interviewed five, five or six people in the last seven days. It's crazy. It's crazy. I can't <laughs> believe we're on number 12. This is just a normal episode now. Yeah, this is just a normal <laughs> Going Yard podcast episode, but... Uh, it's another great episode with another great product demo uh, that's that you'll hear about a little bit later, and I hope you check it out. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been pretty cool, and we just want to thank you guys for sharing this. You know, without you guys doing this and sharing it with your friends, your family members, we wouldn't be able to do this every single week. Uh, just because you know, if we're only talking to five or six people, it's it's not as motivating. But when we see the numbers light up and the different parts of the country and the world light up it, it makes the difference so we appreciate you guys checking that out all over all over the world and uh just do us a favor keep sharing and uh give us a nice review on itunes we're trying to push our itunes a little more now when we first started we were doing mainly just Podbean because that's uh that was our host our host and site. we had a terrible logo on itunes just yeah that was the biggest thing terrible we, logo we terrible were logo. just admitting our terrible fault we were so young logo. we were so, so young, young. <laughs> It's crazy. You're young uh, and naive. We had this crooked put picture of the baseball player. <laughs> yeah. And actually, uh, this will be our uh, three-month anniversary episode in a way. Just, We're holding uh, hands right now. To, to highlight that for everybody out there, this podcast is three months young uh, at the time of listening to this for you on uh, Friday, June 15th. Yep. A lot of mistakes made and uh, a lot of things learned learned a lot of learned uh but i'll tell you it has been an exciting ride so far and mm-hmm. uh we are excited to talk a little bit about some real major league baseball stuff still going on i know we've kind of filled you guys with a ton of information and knowledge from some great people inside of the baseball game but uh today's a an episode where we're going to give you a little bit of mlb talk again for those uh trying to catch back up with uh the mlb draft just happening the all-star game approaching trade deadline mm-hmm. approaching and uh, guys are going up, guys are going down, guys are getting hurt, guys are coming back. It's all over the place. Yeah, and before we start di- diving into that, we feel like we found our niche. I think I said that maybe in the last episode or whatever it was. I feel like we found our niche in, in terms of the people that we're interviewing. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to be reaching out and finding, we're making so many connections with different ball players and everything like that. But the niche that we definitely found was the development of going to the next step and the next level. Even though on the product interviews that we're talking about, most of these guys, actually so far all of these guys are ball players, And the stories that you hear getting to the next level and just having that entrepreneurial mind, uh, it carries over from baseball into the real world. So uh, we appreciate you guys checking out the episodes with the interviews. Um, We found our niche, but I feel like uh, we're we're never going to get away from uh, talking about Major League Baseball. So. It's uh, almost impossible, I think, with 162 games in a year, buddy. Exactly, exactly. Well, let's talk about the first topic. Uh, this gentleman's near and dear to my heart it's this been a year. While. It's been a while since we talked about him. I know. It's it, at least three episodes. Uh, but 
bad news coming from LA. Shohei Otani uh, has a grade two UCL sprain or was it a sprain? Because it's considered sprain tear, mm, partial tear. tear. I don't. Yeah, I, I didn't really fully. There's been a couple reports that that came out. Quickly, yeah. So the biggest thing is he's going to have to get Tommy John surgery. What a shame this is for the game of baseball for the Los Angeles Angels. Yeah. I mean, it's a shame he can't just hit the rest of the year, but you know that's really not possible. But yeah, he. Luckily for the Angels, they got him through the um, the international free agent market. Uh, with the bonus pool money and all that, and it wasn't one of these they had to, you know, go crazy on the the huge contract that you you they if he'd have waited another I think year or two he'd have been eligible for. Uh, so luckily they're not out a ton of money, but they are sure out of a ton of talent. Yeah, I was really upset to read about that. Uh, it popped up on my phone, and I was <laughs> I felt like Bruce from Family Guy. Oh no! I think all. Of the social media world felt that way. Like, oh no, Tiny's getting hurt, y'all. <laughs> I'll tell you, he this guy has been such a good story in the game of baseball, I think, mm-hmm. this year. And the things he's been doing has been, I know he's been having trouble with blisters on his fingers and he had to skip a start, got taken out of a start from it. Uh, but those are things you can kind of work through and figure out a little bit with grip and stuff on the baseball. But this injury here is something you cannot... Get away from when it hits you, it hits you, and it is not an easy recovery. When I was reading about it and I heard about the Tommy John surgery, I went to some article and I didn't check the date on it. And I got kind of excited at first because it said that there was an, they're hopefully, hopefully optimistic that he'll be back by the end of the year. I'm like, wow, back by the end of the year after Tommy John surgery? Wow, that's amazing. And hitting and possibly pitching. And then I realized this was uh, before they got the Tommy John news. So that that was really a shame. So what we're looking at is what, a year, year and a half? I mean, I guess at this point you're hoping that he's full steam ahead by the all-star break next year, man. Ugh, so that, that really puts a damper on a team that kind of, you know, they went out and got Ian Kinsler in a trade. Yeah, uh, They signed, uh, what's his name, to come play third base for them. They re up Justin Upton. You know, this team had aspirations of making a playoff push. Uh, in a division that most of us thought they probably could, right? Short of the Astros, but you know those uh, the Mariners. Yeah, the Mariners. Man. They. I thought after the Robinson Cano ordeal, I thought they would just go down. I mean, currently right now the Angels are seven and a half games behind the Mariners, um, but they have you know with the Mariners and the Astros, I still feel like they they had a chance. Um, I, this I doesn't help them though. This no. does not help them I mean, at all. In they still my have great players on the team, yeah. but yeah, this is. I mean, the bat that they're losing from yeah. Otani, and it, it, that's a question I have for you. How soon do you think we will see him batting? Do you think they're going to do all or nothing, or do you think they're going to have him come in and, and start doing some batting? No, I, I think he'll have a complete rehab, just like a pitcher would have, and they're not going to rush any part of it back. Uh, he's under club control, I believe, until two thousand twenty-two, twenty-three. Uh, don't quote me on that. Somewhere in that world, I think five years. Yeah. Uh, so. I do not see them rushing him back. He may get more time in spring training hitting uh, at that point in the year, but he probably will not be doing any throwing, you know what I mean? And you've seen a couple guys, I believe, you know, like uh, Matt Wieters was a, a catcher, position player, not a pitcher. Uh, he went through the Tommy John thing. Some other guys that are position players uh, have had Tommy John. What's his name for the Yankees? Just had Tommy John on his non-throwing arm. Uh, or last year, so that's so weird. It, it's so weird in a way, but <laughs> I, I don't see the Astros rushing any part of him back to the field until he's completely ready to go on both sides of the ball. <sighs> bummer, though. Real bummer. Yeah. Real good story for Major League Baseball. I guess we should just not do the podcast anymore because yeah. what the hell am I going to talk about? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Take all your posters down now, Dan. Yeah, I know. I had a and your cardboard wall, cutouts, the wallpaper on your phone. You can get rid of that too. <laughs> And the ringtone. Mm. All right, let's talk about another story. Um, I love this guy. I think he's so fun to watch. And he's been fun to watch since 1990. I mean, 98, 99. He's been around for a long time. Uh, Adrian Beltre. Uh, on Wednesday, he became the uh, leading hit, the hit hit leader, hit king, um, to pass Ichiro, Ichiro for... Uh, the most hits out of someone coming from another country. Uh, he's on that short list of 
players. Uh, let's see. He's out of the Dominican. We got Rod Crew on that list. Albert Pujols, Rafael Palmero, Roberto Clemente. Just a few guys you may have heard of. Um, and then Ichiro, Ichiro, of course. Why can't I say that word today? Um, I love this guy. I think he's it's well-deserved. And I think that um, I, I don't know how many more years he has left in him. But I think this is something that I'm glad it happened. Just to, It couldn't happen to a better guy. He is good for the game of baseball. Uh, for as long as he's been doing it, it's impressive that he's been able to stay as healthy as he has to put up the type of numbers uh, that he does at third base. And he's not, you know, he's not like he's a small guy. He's a bigger guy. Uh, but he, he makes the game fun and exciting. He's a clown. He's a clown in a way. He has his moments, you know what I mean? But it, this, I think, will help cement his legacy to get into the Hall of Fame. Do you believe he's a Hall of Fame player? I think so. Yeah. I, I think this As probably, long as we don't hear some shit come out that we don't want to hear about. Yeah, but. yeah. Hopefully, you know, it's not some like he uses some steroid cream <laughs> or some crazy. But I definitely believe that with, with all that he's accomplished, this will cement him as a Hall of Famer. And he, he deserves it. He's good for the game. He's been good for the Texas Rangers. The stuff, the videos, if anybody hasn't seen what we're talking about, you need to go on YouTube <laughs> and look at some of the funny things where he acts like he's going to catch a pop-up. And he's standing by the foul line, and then the shortstop comes over 20 feet away and catches a fly ball. It's hilarious. And then some of the tags and stuff like that, you know, because he's got a – it seems like he has a really good relationship with a lot of guys in Major League Baseball. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Miggy, too. Miggy has the same yeah. – he clowns around, and, you know, he'll push a – he'll try to push a player off the base. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's just he's just messing fake, around. Fake throw the ball back to the pitcher and stuff like that. It's, yeah. It's always funny and always – it's always neat. I mean, this guy's been a perennial all-star for years – He's put up very good offensive numbers, won a couple of gold gloves for sure. You know, so he, he's just a, a guy that doesn't get enough exposure in the national spotlight besides from people who are diehard baseball fans, in my opinion. You know what I mean? So good for him. Sorry for Ichiro, but, you know, all good players get passed at some point, I guess. Yep. Yep. Uh, I was excited to see that. And uh, last story we'll talk about here before we get to our product demo interview. Um this just happened last night. Uh, I just love to talk about this because this, this is not a guy I've, you don't see him getting to tussles much. Um, but I just, I love seeing that. Uh, I like, I like when catchers can hold their ground, uh, even, even when they get run over and they still hold on to the ball. Um, but I, I also like Matt Kemp as well. So Matt Kemp, uh, can't remember. I think it was last night. Um, he, there was, it was a third inning and he was on second base and a ball was hit and, uh, Marzara throws it to the plate and he, he's coming in a rounding third and it was Robinson Torino's caught the ball and he just plows into him, man. It was one hell of a hit. I, I can't believe he held on to the ball. Uh, clean or dirty? Um, it, it kind of looked like a shoulder to the face. I don't <laughs> <laughs> so I guess if you want to call that dirty, um, it was it was a hard and in, obviously intentional hit, and uh, there was definitely some intent to cause pain that you could tell. Yeah, I, I've watched this video, which means it was awesome. Sorry, <laughs> I've watched this video probably ten times, and I've tried to like number one. I don't know why they were sending Matt Kemp home. Right, uh, he's not that fast, mm-hmm. and the ball wasn't hit very deep to right field. It was a great throw, by the way. Gets kind of lost in it. Mm. But at the end of the day, the catcher is supposed to provide a path to the plate, right? Right. I kept trying to look at this video and think, all right, here's a guy who's six foot five, 200, and let's just be nice and say 30 pounds. Right. Who knows where he's at? Chugging around third base, trying to score. How many steps does it take for him to slow down, do you think, to change directions without injuring himself? I was trying to put himself, you know, put myself in those shoes. Yeah. Three, four steps before he could yeah. really change directions. It wasn't like the catcher gave him a clear path. The catcher had straddled the baseline in right. a way. So the catcher kind of set so himself up. See, now up. I have to watch it again. Yeah, no, the catcher kind of set himself up for an impact in the way. And he knew an impact was coming because he braced himself. That's why he held on to the ball. Mm. If he didn't think he was going to get hit from the position he was in, then he probably would have dropped the ball. But yeah. he secured the ball old school in a way, you know, like five pre-Buster Posey getting his leg broke. You know what I mean? Mm. So I'm not so sure it was dirty, but it definitely wasn't needed. 
<laughs> That's how I would put it. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. it, it was interesting. I was, I don't blame the catcher for being mad, and I don't blame Matt Kemp for pushing him after he said something, I guess. You know what I mean? Well, it, it was, started out, it looked like Kemp was trying to reason with him yes. and explain himself, you know? And, and then I, you could tell it just got pretty yeah, pretty heated. Nobody wanted to hear I'm that. I'm surprised it didn't go further than it did. The way that it started, I'm Cole surprised. Cole Hamels, the pitcher, jumped right in there and grabbed him off. I was surprised. Yeah. But now, like I said, I, I literally watched it like 10 times, and I just kept trying to think like, you know, it's it's like NFL instant replay. Mm-hmm. And you look at pass interference, or you look at, uh, you know, is it a catch, is it not a catch? When you slow it down, of course it always looks worse or it always looks more obvious. But when you watch it at full speed, and that's what I don't think enough people do. You know what I mean? You don't see the highlight at full speed all the time on a loop. You just see the slow-mo version of yeah. him coming in. So I, I was trying to put myself in his place there and think that, I, I'm really not sure Matt Kemp could have avoided him is what I'm getting at, I guess, in a long way of saying it. Because, like I said, he's not a small guy. He's not, he's not Jose Altuve who can just break people's ankles a little bit. You know, he's not one of those Billy Hamilton that you know, has that type of speed. He, he's a big guy, and when big guys get chugging, big guys don't slow down usually. You know, and big yeah. guys don't change direction. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I will say one thing. Matt Kemp's been on a tear. <laughs> he's yeah. having a great month of June, and he's really leading. He's really keeping that team relevant in and, that division because they're surely not getting much help from anybody else over there. Yeah, but, the Dodgers are actually on a streak right now. I mean, it's not it's not like a huge. Yeah, it's you know the last three games they've been really doing well. Um, but I mean, even the last couple of weeks. So who knows? I mean, we'll we'll talk I, a little bit I, more about the. Uh, the uh, NL West here a little later in the episode. I, I just hope he doesn't get suspended or something for a few games because that'd be really a shame. I don't think it was really, I don't I see the thing is I, I don't think it was malicious just because of who he is and what he is. You know what I mean? But it definitely doesn't look good. And it's one of those things that unfortunately things happen when you play enough of these games and it happened to them. And luckily nobody got injured and nobody got hurt. And it was just a couple ejections. And like you said, the brawl didn't get any worse than it could have been. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you said uh, Cole Hamels jumped in, but uh, I saw Bellinger jumped in. He was one of the first guys to jump in, too. So really shocked that it, it, it kind of got lost in the uh, the hustle and bustle, and they could, you couldn't really uh, – there was no swings that could be thrown. But I mean, luckily it was probably an interleague game, and it wasn't like, um, you know, if it was the Diamondbacks or yeah. um, the Giants or something, it probably would have been a totally different story being a divisional game as opposed to interleague. So yeah. that might have been one thing that – that helped that situation out. Yeah, so you guys listening out there, give us your thoughts on this. Do you think it was clean? Do you think it was dirty? Who was in the right? Who was in the wrong? Was anyone in the wrong? It's posted on our Instagram. Go on there, leave us some comments and yeah, feedbacks man. on it. And on our Facebook page as well. Find the find the video and leave your comments for us because we'd love to hear what you think about it. That's right. All right, I think that'll wrap it up for now for the uh, MLB talk. Just stick around uh, for the interview here. We're going to have the Glove Hub guys on. And I think you'll enjoy this interview. And uh, stick around after the interview. We're going to talk a little bit more or Major League Baseball. So enjoy. All right. We are on the line with Daniel Jewett, also known as DJ, and Mark Bestemann. DJ is a former first team all state high school quarterback from Illinois who also received a Division I scholarship to play baseball at Northern Illinois University. After college, DJ became a head varsity baseball coach in Baton Rouge, Louisiana where he is a two-time conference coach of the year and a Louisiana Class 2A coach of the year. Mark Besteman is a former member of the Canadian Junior National Team and would later play ball for Northern Central Texas and Northern Illinois University. Together, DJ and Mark became the founders of the Glove Hub, Glove Hub which is the first and only glove humidor that keeps your batting gloves in peak condition between uses. You can check them out at thegloveHub.com. DJ and Mark, thanks for coming on the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no problem. We are very happy to have you guys on here. Um, love the product. Uh, can't wait to actually check it out ourselves and have one um, to, to be able to use here. Um, but very excited to talk to you all about some baseball as well, since you guys both have the college careers. And um, if you don't mind, we'll get started with the questions. All right. Hey, it's Tyler. Sure. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for being on with us. Uh, we really appreciate it, taking the time. And uh, we look forward to sharing your product with our listeners and hopefully sharing our podcast with your, your product fans. All right. So um, let's just jump uh, into it. Uh, DJ, why don't we let you go first? You can... Walk us through a little bit about your college uh, career and experience that you had 
uh, in your time? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I went the junior college route for the first two years out of high school and, um, had originally planned on, on going the football route, uh, but had, uh, just a feeling that have a better chance at reaching the division one level, uh, as a baseball player. So I ended up accepting a scholarship to play junior college in a very, very Southern part of Illinois, small school called Rin Lake college. And then, um, was fortunate enough to get seen, uh, at the right game, I guess I should say the best game I ever had in my life. Just so happened to have a scout from NIU there and was recognized by them. And then that led to conversations and later on a scholarship to go play baseball at Northern. Um, so, you know, uh, what's interesting about this whole recruiting game, and I'm sure there's a lot of kids that are listening to this and, and maybe going through that process, but both places that I ended up playing baseball at the collegiate level ended up being seen by scouts that were there to see other guys. Hmm. Um, so with that being said, one thing, as you know, as a coach that I'm always telling my high school kids is just because a coach may not be there to see you doesn't mean that you can't impress them. And all coaches, you know, they, they have that coaching network. And uh, even if like a division three guy comes and sees your game and you think you're a division one guy, that D three guy may have some connection at the D one level, make some phone calls on your behalf. Uh, so it, it was kind of the way that that worked out for me and, you know, which makes it kind of a, a great story for um, whether it's kids listening or kids that I'm coaching uh, to kind of help them along their path as well. But, um, you know, as, as far as my career goes, I was a uh, center fielder slash leadoff guy mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, really didn't ever feel that I was um, the, the, the best baseball player, that's for sure. But, um, my, my first year when I got to Northern, I came down with a sickness and Mark and Pat having the same thing. I think enough, we both, uh, contracted mono and missed both of our, most of our junior seniors, Damn. uh, junior, junior seasons there. Um, so fortunately, uh, senior year, uh, was able to put together a nice year. And if I think batting second or third in the team, um, after sitting out most of the junior year and, uh, ended up thankfully having a nice finish to, to the career there. So, um, you know, that being said, one other thing that I always, you know, talk about the best parts of playing college baseball is the network that you grow while you're doing it um, and the friends that you make. And it just, for me personally, it was so much more about that and being a part of the team. And I just always loved the road trips. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved the hotel times. I loved, you know, the spring trips that we would take. And it just, you know, it, it wasn't about baseball for me. I just, I loved that side of things. I loved getting to know the friends and, and the camaraderie part of the game. Mm-hmm. And so for me, for the record, DJ, you know, that's, for the record, DJ and I aren't even friends anyway. So <laughs> that's how we are. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's what it was for me, man. I just, Neither Dan and I. That I, ever, I never, yeah, I never really got to the, to the park and thought, man, I'm just dying to play baseball today. I, I loved it, of course, but yeah. I just love being there with my friends and, and, you know, playing the game and, and competing with them out there and, and the camaraderie that came with it. Well, that's that's great, and I love that story because you're not the first one to come on to this podcast. Um, I think it was I think Bill Swaggerty may have said that he was he was recruited in a game that they weren't even looking at him. Uh, we had Mike mm-hmm. Recit- Mike Resitar on. He was recruited on a game that they weren't even looking at him. They were looking at the pitcher, um, and I, I think that's a really awesome story. And several guys go the are, yeah. that we've had on go the junior college route. I yeah. mean, it's very exciting. It's very good baseball. I mean, it's very competitive. That's for it sure. It is. It, it's. I think it's a lot better than people give it credit for. And for a guy like me, I grew up in a very very small town mm-hmm. where the, you know we just didn't get a ton of development. And so my thing was, okay, do I want to be recruited? Uh, at 18 years old or at 20 years old, if I want to try to get to the highest level. And, you know, bottom line, I just, I wasn't ready at 18 years old. Uh, I just, I, I didn't have, baseball wasn't a big deal where I grew up. And it was just, it was, like I said, it was a very small town. And I just felt like, hey, maybe I go this route and maybe I end up getting to play at a higher level if I go this route. And, you know, it just so happened to work out that way. Wow. He was a hero yeah. in, the, in the high school football community. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That is kind of true. But, you know, it's just it's like those old those old <laughs> movies where the whole the whole town centers around this whole small town centers around the football program and yeah and this and that and the other. So it's kind of one of those uh one of those things they could have made a movie about those small town yeah. sports 
school the, range or whatever. By the time baseball season starts, everybody just wants a school year to end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right yeah. about that. So here's, here's the other little funny fact. My, my high school baseball varsity field, when I was in high school, we had an all-dirt infield. And this was going back to 2003. And it had to have been, if not the last, one of the last high school varsity baseball fields with all-dirt infield. I haven't seen one since. You know, most of these schools have these turf infields and all this stuff, but it just nobody cared. I think it was just two or three years ago we finally got grass <laughs> on the high school baseball field. Wow. The, the high school field I coach well, at, the, uh, the grass know, is like you could bail it like, hey, it's so thick. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> we I don't co- know which is worse. But, I'm, you know, in, in Everly, that's the reason why I, I, was, I was a shortstop all through my freshman year, and our infield was so bad that – the, the hops, just it was just, nobody could have fielded there at a high percent. So I was like, you know what? First opportunity I had to go play outfield, I'm going. And I'm never looking back. And so that's what, that's what ended up happening. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's great. Well, Mark, how about you? Now, you, you played for the Canadian Junior National Team and then went on to North Central Texas and on to Northern Illinois University. Can you talk about that? Um, I mean, I don't want you to leave out the Canadian Junior National Team because that's, that's a pretty yeah. awesome – I mean, there. it was kind of a it was a it was a different route to DJ, but we kind of ended up in the same spots and definitely started out in different places. Um, but for me, we didn't. My high school didn't even have high school baseball, so my route was you know you kind of played you know your travel ball program was kind of your um, your all year you know kind of focus. And the way it worked for me is I played on Team Ontario, which is the equivalent to you know, team Illinois or, or whatever. And then, um, you know, was fortunate enough to make it, um, you know, to the, the national team level, which was, you know, something that, you know, just, you know, just happened and, and it was very fortunate to be a part of. Um, and then from there, you know, um, I had some offers to go to some, some bigger schools, but, um, you know, as everybody knows in, in the baseball side of things, it's, uh, you know, 11.7 scholarships for 30 guys. And at that time, um, you know, the uh, Canadian dollar was not the uh, greatest. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I decided to go the junior college route. So um hopped on a car with my parents and we drove from a little bit north of Toronto to Gainesville, Texas. How long was so that ride? It was ride? a three-day trip. <laughs> yeah. I was about to it say. It was a three-day trip. And um funny story is that back then it was, well, 2000. Yeah, 2003. So I had my disc man and uh, <laughs> that's taking, all my that's CDs taking us back. For, <laughs> Sony Walkman. Yeah, except I forgot. I only I only brought one CD and it was Garth Brooks' All Time Hit. So I know that album <laughs> better than anybody on the planet. The Thunder uh, I loved Garth and Brooks. I, I I listened to it for three days straight. Oh my. Um. So yeah, <laughs> got down there, got out of the car, and it was uh, hot. <laughs> 109, 109 degrees and I looked at my dad I said what did I do and uh but you know it ended up being one of one of the better experiences and and for me it was uh you know I for me personally it was a a big um you know I grew up a lot there because I showed up and uh there was three other guys at my position mm-hmm. and they kind of told me they're like oh you're gonna come down you're gonna start and, and whatever and uh you know, I called home and I said, dad, you know, there's three other guys and I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's like, well, sounds like you got to compete and hung up the phone and didn't answer any calls for two weeks. And he kind of just, you know, kind of tough love. And it kind of just forced me to kind of just take it on as a challenge. And, you know, it was good because, you know, you had to grow up and kind of just figure things out for yourself. And, uh, so that was, that was that had a good year. We were, um, you know, I think we won upwards of almost 50 games that year. A lot of guys, a um, couple of guys are in the big leagues off that team. And I think every one of the starters went division one. Um, it was a super competitive, um, league out in uh, Northern Texas. Um, but great experience. And then, uh, I was, I actually got recruited, um, by NIU at a high school. So I kind of just reached out to them after my freshman year and said I was looking to make the switch and, um, was fortunate enough that they had a spot open and in, in the infield and, uh, made my way over to the Calb and, um, third base my sophomore year, played short my, uh, junior year and second base my senior year. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a guy. good thing. 
Yeah, utility guy. You know, I wasn't I wasn't much of a hitter. You know, um, I was you know move the ball around. You know, a lot of sack bunts and I'm with you. Just, I'm with uh, you on that, buddy. Been you know, there. <laughs> you know, you know, just contributed where I could. But um, yeah, we had we had a couple good good runs and and it was just overall for me. I mean, just coming down from Canada and and you know the you know you're coming in and I didn't. I didn't know, you know, everyone's not knowing anybody, but for me, it's kind of uprooting your whole life. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're coming in, you're kind of starting fresh. Um, and like DJ said, you know, the relationships that you have, and especially now with DJ and I, you know, lifelong, uh, you know, best buds and now doing business together. It's, it's something pretty special, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a good journey, but, uh, an interesting one from Canada, but, uh, I'm here and, uh, wouldn't change any of it. That's awesome. I, I mean, that's got to be a very difficult transition for, you know, the average person to, to go that far away from home and everything, you know, and a totally different culture, a totally different climate. And, you know, Texas is a hotbed for baseball compared to Canada, I guess. And I mean, yeah. Canada has its pockets Ooh. of baseball, but I mean, like Texas, you know, they're as big into baseball almost as they are into football in a way, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was fortunate. My roommate was from Canada. He's a little bit older, so. You know, it was, it was good and, and a funny a funny story real quick. The first first day we were there, we went in and we walked up to a Chili's. You know, we're walking up and we're like, yeah, we'll get something to eat. And saw this thing on the menu called chicken fried steak. So we said, well, yeah, let's try a couple of those things. And uh, so they come out and uh, we looked at each other and we said, uh, man, did uh, you guys spill ranch dressing all over these? And she's like, she looked at us. And uh, she's like, no, it's gravy. They're like, we're like, excuse me? And uh, she's like, it's white gravy. We had never seen white gravy in our life, <laughs> and, and, you know, in Canada. But, you know, down the road, when we went to, you know, American Thanksgiving, that's what we call it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we would convince the families that, you know, we've never heard thunder. And, you know, we uh, hunt penguin and, and, you know, all that stuff. And what's Christmas? And, you know, so we had our fun that way. But it was you know, you, you learn a lot and you meet a lot of great people. So it was cool. It was a real, real fun year for me. Wow. Well, DJ, let's move back to you real quick. Um, before we move on to glove hub, tell us a little bit about your coaching experience. What got you into it right off? I don't know if it was right off the bat or not. Um, and what was that experience like? And, um, do you, is that something that you still do or, or is that something that, um, you think you might do down the road? Yeah. So, um, right out of college, I, took a job in downtown Houston, oddly enough, uh, working in finance so at a financial advisory. And um, it was a great learning experience and, you know, wouldn't trade the knowledge that I learned there for anything. Uh, but I, after being there for four years, I was just so eager to get back into, you know, whether it was baseball or just, uh, you know, this passion I always had towards like training athletes mm-hmm. um, and that type of thing. I, you know, I thought to myself, I just, I, I I can't stay here forever. So I wanted to get back into it. I had an opportunity in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, to coach a high school baseball team at this really nice, uh, Catholic high school that, uh, just had a great program and, um, interviewed for it and, and ended up getting the job there. So I spent four years down there coaching. And, you know, if you guys have ever, you know, like you were talking about Texas baseball, where it's just huge and, and everybody competes in it and, uh, they take it very seriously. It's the same thing down in Louisiana, as you know, as you can see it with, LSU's whole roster basically comes from the state of Louisiana. Just great, great talent. No doubt. Um, so coaching down there uh, for those four years was it was really a great experience. You know, the culture of the people down there is fantastic. Uh, huge, huge fan of that Cajun food that they have down there also. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was, it, it, it's phenomenal. I, just, I can't get enough of it. I love going back to visit just to get the food. Do they but, have the um, white gravy? Not there. <laughs> they had all different colors of gravy, <laughs> all different colors that you could handle. They got red, they got dark, gr- dark brown, they got the white, they got everything. Hot, they call extra everything hot, gravy too. Spicy, <laughs> mild. Yeah, right. They call it like a red marinara sauce, or we call it spaghetti sauce. We we'll even call that gravy, which is <laughs> it's an adjustment getting to, to figure out what those people are saying half the time. Nice. But, uh, um, you know the the getting back into baseball and you know, helping kids to, you know, reach the level that they hope to play college baseball at. And, uh, you know, and you got the other kids that just don't have any aspirations to play at a higher level, just want to be able to compete at the high school level. Uh, it's just, it's, it was, it was great. And, you know, you feel great being able to have an impact and getting to know these kids and help them along their journey. 
And uh, I just, I, I love it, man. I just, I really feel that, you know, guys that have a little bit of experience uh, in the game of baseball and have had great coaching in the past in baseball, almost as if it's our duty to try to pay, pay that forward and mm-hmm. pass that along to young, aspiring kids that hope to play high school or college baseball someday. So I, I love the coaching side of things. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm much bigger on the training side of things than I am on the like game management type stuff. Um, because you know, there's a huge learning curve for that part of the game also, but, yeah, for sure. um, you know, the training side of things, the practices, uh, and all that stuff. I just, I love it, man. And, um, so after doing that for those four years, I had an opportunity to be a, a grad assistant at a, uh, division three college outside of Chicago. And so I came up here a couple of years ago for that. And, um, since then, uh, back into the training side of things, I'd, uh, opened up a sports performance training, uh, kind of side business, I guess I would call it. Mm-hmm. And again, basically working almost exclusively with baseball players, um, everything, you know, baseball related. So that's from hitting lessons to the, uh, the weight training side of things to the speed and agility and arm care and all that stuff. Gotcha. That's all. I mean, I've been coaching high school baseball for the past six years, and it's probably been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life, honestly, to, it see, is. to see kids grow up before it your is. eyes. It's very hard, too. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not, easy. It's not like football where it's, they show up two or three weeks before school starts and you get all this time to put your plan in. Like you have a tryout on a Monday, mm-hmm. Tuesday, and your first game is on Friday. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right. and, and then it snows right. and rains and you don't play for two weeks and you're stuck in a gym. It, it's definitely the most challenging sport. Spring sports itself is challenging, but... I think baseball itself in, in the high school baseball is as challenging as it gets. Yeah, you're right. And, and you nailed it with the, the, the limited practices that you guys have before the season, before the games actually start. And especially if you're coaching up in the North. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I was coaching in the South, but now being up in the North, I see it. And some of my friends are still coaching high school baseball. And I'm talking they're, they're at the very end of their season. They've practiced outside four or five times. I can tell you our, our, season, so it, 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 our season this year, we had 20 games. And I think at one point we played like, 10 games in 12 days or something. And we, I think we probably had five or six yeah. out, outdoor practices all, all season. It was crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Honestly, it's very yeah, difficult. That's it's not, exactly it. Not easy at it's all. It's tough, but on, on, along those, along those lines, it's, you know, when you're trying to figure out who, who your guys are, you know, it's, you know, ever, you know, who your top three, top four, top five guys are. That's easy, but it's, it's making up those lineups when you really haven't had the practices to see those, those guys that are kind of on, on the fence of playing time. Uh, and seeing who, who you really got there and, and you're drawing up lineups and the other thing with baseball and like football or basketball, where you're just subbing guys in and out nonstop throughout the game. You know, you're, you're, you basically go with your nine for the game and the other guys are just sitting on the bench and those <laughs> leave us some tough conversations. So yeah. it's not easy courtesy run, you know, be ready for it. That's about, about all we're going to do maybe. So. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. keep, your hel- keep your helmet on your head. <laughs> Stay warm. No. <laughs> Let, let's jump. Mark, how about you take us through how you and uh, DJ a- exactly got together and you came up with this idea to create this Glove Hub uh, company and product, uh, you know, and just l- let our listeners know about the relationship you two have and how that developed into this partnership. Yeah, so, um, you know, DJ and I, we've always kept in touch, um, you know, after college and, and, you know, we've always, you know, kind of, um, you know, shared the same mindset as, as far as what we wanted to do, you know, after, um, you know, after college and after baseball. And, and obviously we were very, you know, realistic as, as our careers ended that the, uh, you know, the MLB was not in our future. Um, so we, you know, we kind of just, uh, prepared ourselves accordingly. We kind of went our different routes and, you know, DJ was down in Louisiana and, and, uh, you know, I was, I was in, uh, you know, in Chicago, you know, working my way through the, the hospitality industry and, um, uh, you know, we just kind of connected and, and we said, Hey, you know, let's, let's try to, let's try to put something together here. So, you know, we bounced a couple ideas off, off each other as, as far as what we wanted to do. And, and, um, you know, we kind of just, just came to the, uh, came to the idea of, of, you know, DJ had mentioned that he's you know, he's been, he's been tossing this idea around and then, uh, you know, he kind of filled me in on it. So we, we started talking about it and, you know, we tested it out a little bit and, and next thing you know, we're, we're coming up with a name and, and we're, uh, we're putting it together. So, uh, but it's good because, you know, you've already established that, um, that trust, you know, with the, that you, that you get with a teammate, 
and you, you've kind of been through some, you know, um, some stressful times as far as whether it's in game or, you know, just, just being a, a student athlete, you know, traveling and keeping up with school and, and, you know, personal stuff and, and all that into one, it, it, it can be tough, but for, you know, when, you, when you're looking for a business partner, you know, you want someone that, that um, obviously you can get along with because you're going to be, you know, be around them a lot. And if I can, you know, sit next to them for 18 hours on a bus, <laughs> bus ride with one bathroom and no showers, I think I can handle. <laughs> yeah, that's a good sign. You know, some, yeah. <laughs> you know, some, <laughs> some long nights working on it. So, yeah, I think it was, it's that trust that we've had with each other. And, and, you know, we've, we've always wanted to do it. And, uh, you know, now that we've got, we, we got the right idea and we feel that we got the right product, I think, you know, we've, we've always gotten along, but I think we're, we're a good combination as far as, you know, the experiences he's gone through and, and, and the experiences that I've gone through in the, in the professional world. I think, you know, it's, you know, uh, right partnership at the right time with the right product is, is what I, is what I think. So I, I think we're in a, we're in a pretty good spot. We're excited. Definitely. And I've never seen anything like it because there is nothing like it at the moment. And I know DJ handles all the manufacturing, product development, and logistics, and uh, Mark handles operations, business strategy, and marketing. Um, I will ask, let, let me ask DJ first, and you guys can both answer this. Um, but it, it, explain what the product is and what is the benefit of using it for our listeners who have no clue what we're talking about. Sure. So, um, you know, anybody that plays baseball, grew up playing baseball or golf is very familiar with that, that issue you have with your batting gloves or your golf gloves. It's, you know, you, you put them in your bag after the game or after you're around and you come back to them and they're, they're wadded up and, uh, they're just hard. And, and, you know, I guess for lack of better words, they're all crusty, that feeling. And then the next day when you go to put them on, you're, you got to lube them up somehow or, or, you know, you know, whatever it is. And, and we're just all familiar with it. So, the idea here, um, and the idea kind of came from what, what is it that we can do to fix this problem? And it's kind of scratching our own itch because we're both golfers and we still deal with this ourselves, but like, okay, the, the problem is clearly that the gloves are drying out. Uh, what is something that is out there? Or what is something that we could create to stop that from happening? And that's when kind of the, you know, the, the idea of the humidor came to mind. Uh, let's mm-hmm. stop these gloves from, from drying out. And so what we basically did is after testing it out for a little while and realizing how well it actually worked, keeping uh, gloves in a humidor, uh, we decided, okay, let's take the next step here. Let's, let's resize it because you can't find one of the right size because, you know, you have these cigar humidors that uh, they're, they're huge and they're made of hard wood, which, which will warp, uh, you know, when it's out in the elements and stuff and mm-hmm. changing temperatures to get too hot or whatever it is. And so we said, okay, let's resize it to fit the, fit the batting glove or the golf glove. Let's change the exterior to a more durable um, material so that it's not going to fall apart mm-hmm. and all this stuff. But we're going to take this similar idea of what the Spanish cedar wood that humidors use and throw that on the interior so that it gets the benefits of maintaining that humidity. Or I guess if you want to call it managing the, the moisture content inside the box. And so uh, after I don't know how many trial runs we had of different many designs of samples coming in yeah we finally um felt like we got through the right spot and got to the right product and um it ended up uh launching earlier this year with our product and just kind of been off the race since then but you mentioned something that you know when you're when you're bringing something to the market that's the first thing that you're that it's just brand new nobody's ever had this idea before is not familiar with it you got to spend a lot of time educating your uh your market or the people out there on what it is Right. So you can't just like look at it and know what it is because it's, it's never existed before. Right. So, you know, I think that we've found that uh, the big part of this is educating those people out there on, on how this works and why this works and why this is something that you should legitimately consider keeping your gloves in. And, you know, the answer to those is and what we've found uh, based off of, you know, customer that we've had that reach back out to us and say, we can't believe how well this thing works. We've got, uh, we got a college baseball player down in the Dallas area that reached out to us a couple of months ago. He said, I've had the same pair of, pair of batting gloves since November. And he was on like game 40 of the season. They're, you know, almost done with their season. And he said, I've never had a season before that I use less than like three sets of gloves. He said, mm-hmm. I've had these through all of our winter practices, through all 40 of our games so far. He's just like, they're in perfect condition still. It's amazing. And then 
on the golf side of things, you've got this uh, gentleman that, that works alongside us in the PGA Tour caddy, and uh, he's been going through a testing with his golf glove. And as of last week, he was on round 34 or 35 with the same golf glove, the same ident- the same golf glove for 34, 35 rounds. And he's just, just blown away at how well this thing's working. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, anybody that's familiar with golf knows that, you know, maybe seven to 10 rounds at best with a golf glove. And that thing's got, you got a hole in somewhere in the palm or in the thumb or somewhere. And our, our guy that's doing the testing, he's on around 34 with the same glove. Wow. So it's, it's extremely effective, uh, almost to the point that you can't even believe how effective it is. Uh, and it, you know, my opinion, aside from the effectiveness of it, I just, I think it's really neat to carry your gloves in this neat looking box. that's just designed for it. Yeah. And, and yeah, Mark, gotta, you know, and Mark, yeah, go ahead. For, and you, and uh, DJ kind of brought it up. It's a brand new product and, and it's a whole new marketplace that you're trying to enter in. Uh, and, and I know you kind of handle the, the marketing, uh, business strategy on it. What were some of the things that you initially tried to jump into to get this out to as many people as you possibly could? Um, you know, for us, it's, it's really identifying, you know, what is our, you know, who is our, our target market and, you know, um, who's buying it? Are they, is it, you know, is it the consumer that's buying it or, you know, is it, is it the parent that that's buying it? So when we were, you know, kind of putting this together and kind of putting our strategy together, we kind of realized that, you know, the market for this is so big because, you know, you know, you got youth players that can use it. You got high school players, college players all the way through and golfers, you know, all ages. And there, there's all different ways that you can get to them. But, um, you know, we kind of just looked at, you know, who is faced with this the most. And I think it's, you know, obviously the travel ball players and the high school players and, and, you know, the avid golfers. And, you know, I think we, we felt that if we can get them to like it um, and get them to use it, that it'll, it'll naturally spread down into the other, other phases of the market. Because, you know, for us, we look at it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a usable product for, a, for an athlete, um, but it's also, you know, a great gift as well. So, you know, a Father's Day gift and, and a lot of our, you know, golf customers and we're in, you know, um, a wide, wide range of, of golf courses and, and country clubs. It's a great member gift and tournament gift. Um, you know, instead of getting a polo, you know, every year or a sleeve of balls, you're getting something new with a, you know, a course logo on it or something like that. But, um, you know, one of the biggest things is, is everyone is looking to save a buck, especially a travel ball parent or, you know, no you have the cost of hotels <laughs> and, and those weekends and things like that. And, you know, batting gloves, good batting gloves aren't cheap. You know, and if, if you can put a product out there that can help, you know, some parents save a couple blocks, um, you know, that, that was kind of, you know, what we were looking at too. And I think, um, you know, once the product gets out there a little bit more, I think a lot of people are going to see it for that as well. You know, it's a good looking product. It's usable, but it can also help you save a, a little bit of bucks. Batting glove companies might not like us very much, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I mean, and like a, you just, you yeah. just said that, you know, batting gloves aren't cheap and they're not, I mean, I remember when you could get batting gloves for like 10 bucks and it didn't matter. Now they're 30, 40, $50, mm-hmm. you know, easily for adult mm-hmm. size batting gloves. I mean, how much does your, does mm-hmm. the glove hub itself cost, uh, for a customer to purchase? Uh, we run it at, we run it at twenty nine ninety nine. Um, that's our, that's our price and, and we're, you know, we, we feel good about it. We wanted to make it affordable. Um, you know, something that, that, you know, most, you know, a wide range of, of families can, you know, can afford to, to purchase it. And, and we think it's, you know, it's a, it's a good quality product for that price. And I think it does a lot for the, for the, the customer, um, you yeah. know, for in that price range, not very many products in that price range can do what we think the glove hub can do, um, for these, for these people. Yeah. And the other side of that, and I'll, I'll add to it is. You know, I mentioned before the idea of just of keeping your gloves, keeping them fresh uh, in this neat looking box that was designed here. But just, there, there's no better feeling than showing up to the baseball field or the golf course and like your gloves in perfect condition, like it's right out of the wrapper. It's yeah. soft. It's ready to put on immediately. And going back to that old feeling that you guys are all familiar with and we are very familiar with and everybody is that plays baseball or golf pulling that old crappy glove out of there. It's got holes in it. And it's, <laughs> it's like it's filled with it's concrete. Just, yeah. It's such a nice, it's like a luxury <laughs> yeah. of all luxuries pulling that. Oh, Cause there's, there's every single yeah. time. 
yeah. there's the, you know, everyone's using the plastic bag or, you know, you got people that, uh, you know, or, you know, trying to air dry them or things like that. And, and, you know, we've, we've been in that position before we were those people, you know, yeah. and, and it's, mm-hmm. you know, and, and when we were thinking about it, we're, you know, when we were trying to come up with a business idea, we're like, we need to find a, a, a problem and find a solution. And I think, you know, it was, been, there's nothing out there like it. And I think, you know, once people see it, you know, more, they're going to be like, finally, you know, mm-hmm. there's actually something that's, that's out there that's, that can, that can solve the issue. Yeah. There's nothing better. Cause I, yeah, I haven't played baseball for years, but over the, over the past 10 years, I've played many, many, uh, years of uh, slow pitch softball, which my glory days are over, but that's still a way that I can, uh, live my dream. Uh, but there's nothing better. Cause I've, I bought <laughs> expensive batting gloves and there's nothing worse um than you know you your first couple of times wearing it's the best feeling in the world and then all of a sudden they're just like any other pair that you have laying in the bottom of your bag uh feel like sandpaper um so i definitely can relate to that uh one thing i want to say is uh if, if for anyone listening go to their website um, it's the glovehub.com. Check out the promo video. I love the promo video. Um, cause not only are you guys talking baseball, you're talking golf as well. And, uh, I had mentioned before we started recording, um, I, I golf sometimes I have a lot of friends that golf a lot. Um, and it's, I love the promo video cause it's, it's kind of, it's funny at, uh, at the same time as it's just showing exactly yeah. what this can do. And I love that the box, it, not only can you put your gloves in it, you can put, extra teas in it. You can put your cigar in it. You can put, um, put everything in there. So it's, it, it's, yeah. Yeah. So I, I would recommend anybody checking that out, but I, I just think it's, it's very versatile and it's, it's not a big, you know, it's not something you have to a huge that you have to lug around and it's, it's, it seems like it's worth it. You know, real quick for me, the yeah. one, I'm sorry, the one quick that really Go. caught my eye about this was, you know, if you go out and spend three, four hundred dollars on one of these A two thousands or rolling gold gloves, they give you this nice custom bag to put your fielding glove in. You know what I mean for your kid or uh-huh. for you to use. And uh-huh. I instantly thought of like, well, why? Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Why wouldn't you put your batting gloves in something as well? Yeah, yeah that's a great I mean, point, man. I, I honestly feel like this is something people can kind of grasp onto the idea because you mentioned before back when we were in college or high school or say the, you know, the nineties or eighties or whatever, batting gloves were just, you know, five to $10. So it's not, it's not much of an investment, right. but these days with the quality of the gloves they're coming out with. And if, if you go to Dick's Sporting Goods right now or wherever, and you look on the shelf, there's $50 set of batting gloves everywhere. And these are the gloves that the kids are wearing too, because, you know, you want to have the best advantage you can as a hitter or, or whatever it is. And so they're, they're buying these 40, $50 batting gloves. And, you know, instead of just, throwing them like they're pieces of the trash at the bottom of your bag and letting them get all crusty and, and dirty and all this stuff. I just, I feel like people can get on board with the idea of just of taking care of these things because they're expensive. You're making an investment and you want them to stay nice for, for a long period of time. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've always thought, we've always, you know, taught, tossed around the idea of, you know, potentially, you know, talking with some of these batting glove companies and, and, and like you said, why, how cool would it be for your, you know, if you get batting gloves that could, you know, show up at your door in a, in a, in a custom glove hub with the, you know, batting glove company logo on it. I think it's, I think it'd be cool. And it's a, it's, it's a great way to present the gloves, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a care product. You know, it's, it's something that could, you know, like you said, if, you know, Bryce Harper's wearing those Under Armour gloves or Chris Bryant, you know, every kid's going to want them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if we can, you know, not have parents spending two hundred dollars a season just on batting gloves. I mean, it, it's it's a it's a good thing for everybody. Mm-hmm. No doubt, no doubt. Um, you know, I, there was something you we had talked about prior earlier a little bit, and that is uh, about the the batting glove that you guys are currently working on and all of that. Can you just let our listeners in a little bit uh, more into that product that you got that you're working on? Yeah, so yeah, we have. Sure. We, we, yeah, Mark, DJ, DJ will talk more about the, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, I guess the technical term of it, but we, we have a company, uh, it's called Jack's Athletics and we will be working on a batting glove. Um, you know, the product's been about four years in the making, but, um, you know, we, we happen to partner up with these guys and, and we're bringing it to life. Um, so it's a, it's definitely a new good quality glove, but it's got a, a, a nice little twist to it, um, that I think a lot of people, 
um, we'll, uh, we'll find very interesting. So, uh, DJ, why don't you let them know a little bit about the, uh, the technology side of it? Yeah, sure. So, uh, basically what it is, is it, we, we've patented this webbing that is between the index finger and, uh, thumb on, on your top hand of the batting glove. Uh, at this point, we're still thinking about putting the web on both hands, uh, for, for both batting gloves. But mm-hmm. at this point, we have the, the webbing just in the top hand. And so what that webbing does is when you go to grip the bat, and you guys know as baseball coaches that every kid out there grips the bat incorrectly. They've got the bat held deep in their top hand, yep. which means the barrel is going to drag the hands through the zone, which means less whip, fast speed, all that stuff. You know, and, and holding the bat in the right part of the top hand closer to into the fingers is going to increase all those things. Um, so essentially the that thumb pad that you see, like half of the big league players wearing these days, everybody thinks that that thing's all about the sting protection. And that's just, that's a small part of it. It's more about holding the bat properly. So what we've done is, is we've noticed that with this webbing that we place between the thumb and the index finger, it does the identical thing basically of that thumb pad, except it's, it's more effective. It doesn't cost $14. It comes along with the glove itself. It promotes that proper top hand grip, which means again, better width to the zone, more bat speed and more power. And at, at the same time, um, you know, it provides a, a, what I would consider to be better sting protection than anything else that's, uh, that's offered out there as well. So this little mechanism that we figured out, um, for this top hand, you know, the guys that we have swinging right now, we've got a few guys in the minor leagues that are swinging. We've got some, some high school baseball players that are swinging and some junior high kids all the way down. Uh, they're just, they're crazy about it. And every time that somebody puts this glove on, they're like, wow, I just, I can't believe nobody thought about this before because it's effective. It, it does a great job of, forcing you to hold the bat properly. Mm -hmm. And when you're holding the bat properly, as you guys know, it's going to improve performance. So, you know, it's kind of a little slogan that we've come up with is that Jack's batting gloves is setting hitters up for success because that's what it's doing. That's it's, it's forcing good habits. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, So what is your, what is the plan for, I know you had said a, a couple of minor league teams are using it. Um, for either of your products, so are you are you currently looking to go uh, into into the major leagues? Is that is that something you're 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 doing now? Do you already have uh, some major league teams using some of your products, or is this is this something you want to focus more on the uh, minor league, college, and, and below? Um, I think for you know for us for the batting gloves, you know we're it's not um, once we get it fully released out to the market. I think you know, because we have, uh, you know, the patents on it, you know, definitely, you know, would love to get to the major league level. And, you know, it's a tough, it's, you know, as I'm sure listeners out there know, you know, licensing to get into the, the major league level is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Yeah. Um, but definitely from the batting gloves, um, we would, we would love to get, get there. Um, you know, with the glove hub and I think for both of them, it, for us, it's, you know, we, we'd love to explore every, every opportunity, um, you know, but for, for right now, I think we're, we're sticking, you know, really for, for the glove hub, um, you know, and the, especially on the golf side, the amateur golf side yeah. and, the, and the country clubs and, and, you know, for the, for the glove hub, you know, we, we're in a, we talk a lot with, um, travel programs, um, you know, and, and kind of getting them custom ones. Cause we do have the ability to put, you know, logos on, on the outside and, and, oh, um, nice. You know, so that that's kind of kind of where we're at with you know youth and high school and college and and you know the the, the softball market's really um, you know the slow pitch market has really um, caught on to the product um, and you know for Jacks too I think with it with its ability to be a you know a learning tool um, I think you know for us is if we can get into the youth market and and help players out and you know give them a good affordable product I think that that to us is always the goal and, and if, at whatever level, um, you know, obviously the dream is to always get, get to the highest level possible. But for us, it's, it's just putting a good product out there that's reliable and it's going to help, help people, whether it's save, save some bucks or, you know, help them with their game. I think that's, that's our goal. Um, you know, but I think, I think there's endless opportunities with both. I, I, I really believe that. So is there anything else that we're missing as, you know, podcast host here that you know that you want to bring up and you want to talk about the glove hub or the jacks that you know you think is really important for our listeners to know about it 
Uh, I mean, you know, for, for the glove hub, I think, you know, we've touched on it. I think it's a new product. I think it's, it's something that, that, you know, I, I think you really have to test it out to really understand what it, what it does, because, you know, for us with, with, you know, you, Tyler, I think you brought up the, you know, the organizational piece to it. We didn't, you know, our customers kind of told us that. So, you know, finding out, you know, we might get down the road a new use for it, but I think people will be, you know, really pleased with, um, you know, how their gloves are kept and how long they last and, and, you know, how easily, you know, the product fits into your bag and it's affordable. And I think Jack's, you know, we've tested it, um, you know, at all levels, uh, minor league all the way down to youth. And, and we think it's really, really something that's gonna, that's gonna, um, change the, the batting glove market. Because if you really think about it, there hasn't really been much, um, that's changed with the batting glove in the last 40 or 50 years. Not I mean, the designs have gotten cooler and, yeah. and, you know, there's, um, you know, different, you know, colors and, and new companies that come out, but, there's nothing that's ever really been changed. And I think we're the first, um, you know, us and our partners are the first to, uh, to do it. And I think, uh, I, I really think it's going to be something special, something cool. Definitely excited to be a part of, but we're, we're excited to get it out to hitters and, and have them see uh, the benefits that we've seen in testing. So we're excited. Yeah. That in uh, in the fact that it's affordable, I mean, that price you you buy you buy the uh, glove hub, and you're going to save so much money in the long run. And that's why when I meet when I initially brought up about the MLB, uh, that was my question there. I'm like, I bet you they could save so much money from not having to buy gloves. They don't care. They don't care. But they don't care. <laughs> but I, I I feel like that would be <laughs> such a a good idea. But um, the problem. Well, I do I do have I do have one thing that I, I would like the listeners to know is that if you, when Jack does come out into the market mm-hmm. we're gonna we're gonna have a custom jacks uh glove hub available for purchase online uh at uh ten dollars or ten dollars cheaper than our retail price so twenty dollars custom jacks so your jacks gloves will come in a uh, custom glove hub wow. so that's something cool yeah that's also awesome. that was my next question too is what what type of current promotions you have going on right now or um anything you can tell tell our listeners about um anything anything in the pipeline as well i don't know if you can disclose any of that but is there anything else kind of you're working on in the pipeline for new products dj you can talk about the 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 new the new 2.0 is coming in for the glove hub Mm. yeah we uh so our original production run with the glove hubs um i told you we we changed the the material that was on the outside of it to make it more durable and all this stuff so about maybe a month or so after we got those in, we, you know, our goal is to keep evolving into a better and better product and, uh, experiment anything with some different ideas of how we can make the products better. Uh, and, you know, we come up with the new material to put on the exterior to basically make it even more, uh, durable. So, uh, we've got this proprietary, I guess you would call proprietary acrylic blend that, uh, is going to make up the exterior of the glove hub mm-hmm. and while maintaining these uh the inside spanish cedar so we've we've had our manufacturers develop these spanish cedar trays that are um glued onto the inside while the exterior is this full fully acrylic type material um and that way you know with, with the hinges and stuff that'll be in there are are basically melted into the acrylic itself and uh just to make it more durable because you know bottom line as it if, if you've got your glove hub or whatever in your baseball bag, you're, those, you toss those things around quite a bit, whether it's in the back of your vehicle or mm-hmm. at the bottom of a bus when you're going on a road trip. And, uh, you know, you're not, you're not gentle with it because there's nothing fragile in there whatsoever. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, our whole thing was we, we had to come up with something that's basically indestructible. Uh, and uh, alongside that, uh, I, I think it looks a little bit more sleek with the new material as well. So nice. we call this the glove hub 2.0. We've got more samples on the way uh, as we speak, and uh, we should be coming out with those here in probably the next six weeks or so. So we're really excited about that. We feel like it's a huge step up uh, from the 1.0, to be honest with you. I'm going to hold off on yeah, my... Yeah, kids aren't gent- Yeah, kids aren't gentle, so we figured we should make it, uh, you know, make it a little tougher. 
Um, for the for the customer out there, what size actually is the glove hub? Like, what are the dimensions of it for people that are thinking about, you know, like, oh, does this fit in a book bag style? Does it, you know, how easily does this fit in my golf ball bag, you know, my golf bag? What, what are the dimensions of the glove mm-hmm. hub, if you know them offhand? So, I do, I do. So, the, uh, the golf size is nine and a half inches long and an inch and a half thick. So, you know, the golf bag has much, much less space than the baseball bag, so we made it quite a bit thinner. Uh, not quite as wide and about an inch shorter. So the golf one's nine and a half inches by about an inch and a half tall and then four and a half to five inches wide. Uh, so there's, there's not a golf bag in the planet that this would not fit in comfortably. Uh, and again, you, if you, when you, you talk about the whole organization side of things where you keep, you can keep your keys in there and, um, your divot tool and your ball marker and all this stuff uh, along with your glove. Um, it's just, it's something that we felt is as small as we could possibly get this thing, uh, and still perfectly fit inside your bag and all that stuff. The baseball one, on the other hand, since there's going to be two gloves inside there for top and bottom hand, uh, we're at about 10 and a half inches on the length. Uh, that way it fits extra large gloves pretty easily. Uh, if you're a double XL, uh, you may be a little bit scrunched in the fingers, which is, is not an issue whatsoever. And it's about six and a half, seven inches wide and uh, a little bit under two inches tall. So. Again, it's, the, the size is, is huge and something that we probably change more so than anything along the process is trying to get this thing to the ideal size so that it doesn't take up space inside the bag. Nice, nice. Um, <clears throat> well, can you tell us, uh, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Obviously, I said the, I said the website a couple of times, but even on social media or is there anything else you guys want to plug uh, for where people can find you? Yeah, we have, uh, we're on Instagram and we, we post on there pretty frequently. Uh, so if you search at the glove hub on Instagram, it is the same thing on Facebook as well. And then, uh, you know, again, with the Jack's batting gloves coming out here pretty soon, uh, we have not started that, but, uh, I hope that the listeners will be on the lookout for it within the next month or so. So that'll be Jack's J A X batting gloves on, uh, on all the social media, the Facebook and Instagram and at the glove hub as well all right awesome awesome thank you yeah we appreciate you guys coming on is there anything else you guys want to add before we uh ask you our last question no not on my end martin yeah no i think we're we're good just appreciate the opportunity it was uh it's fun to be on Absolutely. No problem, guys. We're, we're excited. I, and I can't wait to, to check out the product uh, myself. And I know we'll have some listeners that are going to check it out yeah, as we well. Yeah, we ordering the you know, Going Yard podcast logo on top. On yeah, that'd be boys. great. Absolutely, you can. Consider it, consider it done. That'll be awesome. Happy to do it. Perfect. All right. <laughs> All right. So Appreciate guys, it. He, DJ and Mark, here is our question we ask to every single person that we interview on our podcast. If you guys had one at bat in the major leagues... What would you choose for your walkout song? Well, <laughs> I mean, if I wanted that in the big leagues, I mean, hopefully it's not with anything on the line. Uh, maybe like you know, eight <laughs> inning down ten. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I, I'd, I'd go uh, R. Kelly. I believe I can fly. Um, you know, I was not a good hitter, and uh, and never claimed to be. Um, you know, lefty, just moving around. So. You know, get the crowd on my side. You know, I hear a song like that, you know, feel good. And, you know, maybe I'll get some cheers before the actual uh, <laughs> the actual action happens. I Space think Jam, my man. Mindset. How about Space Jam yeah. reference? That's what I was thinking yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Space yeah. Jam, there you go. You, you, there's no, you don't, there, you feel good when you hear that song. So that's, that's, that's the goal. Because <laughs> they're not going to feel good after the, after the at-bat. <laughs> that's great. I appreciate that. All right. So there's one. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I, I think that I would go with, and I don't know the exact name of it, but I believe it's the, the Cha Cha Slide. Okay. Which is played at all the weddings out there. All right. You physically cannot listen to that song and not stand up and start clapping to it. So <laughs> going along the lines of with, with what Mark said. I'm going to see three pitches before I'm walking back to the dugout. And <laughs> the least that I could do is hope to get people out of the stand to start clapping for me. So they're not going to be clapping on the way out like Mark alluded to. But I would get on the plate on your way back to the dugout. <laughs> DJ yeah, was okay. a better hitter. D, DJ was a better hitter than me, though. I'll, I'll give him that. He was a better hitter than me. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, three pitches and I'm going down, though. There's no doubt about it. 
That's awesome. That is awesome. Well, uh, we appreciate your time on here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And uh, we hope to uh, talk to you guys soon. And we're definitely going to order those uh, glove hubs with the Going Yard podcast logo on it. That's for sure. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Great to hear. Thank you. Really appreciate you guys having us on. Yep, no problem. See ya. All right. Featuring the platinum band. <laughs> and this time, we're gonna get funky. 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 Everybody clap your hands. Clap, your hands. clap, 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 clap your hands. Clap, 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 clap your hands. All right, now, we're gonna do the basic step. To the left. Take it back now, y'all. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. We're going to move on to the bottom of the ninth segment, and we're going to talk about... uh, We're not going to really do the entire around the horn. I guess we kind of are, but we're going to talk about the standings this year and the MLB. We're going to start in the East. I'm sorry, start in the AL and uh, move on to the NL. Um, Let's talk about the AL East. Hasn't changed much on top. Right now, New York and Boston kicking ass. Uh... Tampa Bay and Toronto, they're both below 500, but they're close. Um, so the only thing to really say is who's going to finish in first with New York and Boston and by the All-Star break, and uh, who's going to be in that third spot is going to be Tampa Bay and Toronto. It's certainly not going to be the Baltimore Orioles because they haven't even gotten 20 freaking wins yet. <laughs> no, no. I mean, and honestly, I mean, like Tampa, Toronto, they're, they're 11 and a half, uh, 14 and 16 and a half back, too. They're, they're done. Yeah. They're, they're out of it. They're, right. They can't even compete with these other two guys. I mean, it'll be an interesting – Race to the finish. You see uh, what what the Yankees are putting up some bombs, and they got these young guys playing as well. It's a very interesting mix. We'll see what uh, Dombrowski does in Boston because I'm sure he's going to make a trade. He'll he'll completely deplete that farm system with a big trade. I'm sure at the deadline trying to chase another another W or another you know crown in the East. So we'll see. It'll be interesting. But th- those two teams are going to be a dogfight the rest of the year. Yeah, it's really fun, especially watching it with Mookie Betts and uh, JD Martinez. Well, for Boston, man, it's it's just it's filthy. Those I'll, guys are good. Benintendi's really good. Yeah, Benintendi I mean? as well. Yeah, their pitching's not not wowing me that much. But we'll see what happens if David Price gets it together and a couple <laughs> other guys. Who knows though? The offense is what carries them the most. And same with the Yankees. Really, they need they'll they'll make a trade. I'm sure for a pitcher at some point. I'm sure they're regretting not getting Gary Cole over the off season though from the Pirates. You know, let's talk about uh, and a division that's not as exciting to watch. Uh, it's it's they're not. You know, not it's not like the East anyway, but AL Central, <laughs> Cleveland, uh, just over five hundred. And who would have thought the team in second place? Yeah. <laughs> who saw <laughs> the, that coming? Yeah, what what happened there? Um, it's actually I was watching uh, last couple games. It's well, at least highlights. I wasn't actually sitting down and watching the Detroit game, but uh, it, it's funny. You got people in the stands again. Remember the beginning of the season? It was like just like the the Orioles games. It was like no one was there because they, they were horrible. Winning covers up a lot of problems. I mean, I'll be interested to see what Detroit really does because they're definitely not competitive enough, I think, to compete with the big teams uh, in, in the rest of the AL for the playoffs. But, you know, they got a really, really good pitcher, Michael Fulmer. So I'll be interested to see if they trade him to make another big splash to get some players back. I mean, they are four games still under 500, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it, uh, it tells you about how weak the division is. I'm shocked Minnesota's as bad as they are. Uh, the White Sox, we all kind of knew were rebuilding, and the Royals, I'm sure uh, they're going to make a few trades with some of their players. It'll be interesting to see where they go. But, you know, is Cleveland just lucky that they're in a terrible division? Yeah. Or are uh, they good still? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think uh, the one thing I think is really strange is there's a couple of teams that when we talked about the Mariners in the beginning of the episode, it's weird. They, le- they lose one of the best players. Same thing with Detroit happened. And they play better. And they play better. Yeah. So I guess that's cool. They're 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 kind of improving with adversity. Cleveland's bullpen's got to get better if they want to be competitive. I mean, but they got Trevor Bauer. They're 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 starting rotations pretty pretty solid, pretty legit. Yeah, and the season started off where the the starting rotation was always good, but it was just the guys that were coming in for them, and you know yeah. they lost a lot in their bullpen. So. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's, it's go over to the. Uh, do you want to say something else about that? No, no. I'm going to cut you off. No, no. We'll jump over to the AL West here, buddy. A, yeah, AL West right now. Seattle and Houston. Seattle's in first. Uh, again, there's another thing I, I didn't think I'd see. I, I really thought that uh, Houston was going to going to stay on top, and possibly the Angels would have been the ones to uh, compete closer to the top there, but. Uh, you know the Angels in Oakland right now they're below 500, um, seven and a half games behind. 
but uh, I, I like I like what I'm seeing with Seattle. It's it's definitely more exciting to watch than I imagine it would be, especially with you know Houston on their tail. So, yeah, I'll tell you the one thing that I noticed that kind of jumped out to me was uh, how uh, Seattle's pretty balanced. I saw their their home and road splits are pretty even, twenty three and twelve versus twenty one and twelve. But Houston, man, I, they're nineteen and fourteen at home. But man, they are some road warriors, twenty six mm. and eleven on the road, which. That tells me they're ready to go play anywhere. Uh, and I'll be interested to see when it heats up how well they do down there in Houston uh, because I think that that, that really helped be, it was a big key to them, how well they play in the playoffs at home. Uh, so, But the, the, I don't know if Seattle's going to keep this pace or not. I'll be really interested to see if they really can hang on this long or if they're just really on a hot streak. Houston's the real deal, in my opinion, still. Mm-hmm. Uh, their, their rotation's as solid as anybody in baseball, uh, and they have a lot of tons of young talent in their offenses probably one of the most dynamic offenses in all of baseball. So uh, I'm sure Seattle will hang around in the wild card hunt, though, but I just think Houston, when you get to the dog days of summer, is going to start to pull away a little bit in that division. I just think it's going to be really exciting in playoff playoff time for the American League. I think it's going to be really awesome to watch. And uh, it's a shame that, you know, we won't be able to – that we can't watch, like – a New York and Boston World Series. That would be cool. But yeah. that would, I'm sure Major League Baseball would love it. Oh, I know. My gosh. But, uh, yeah, I think it will be fun. But let's move on to the NL East. Currently, you got Atlanta still staying hot. But the the teams that are in first, second, and third, Atlanta, Washington, Philly, uh, they're all kind of neck and neck. Three and a half games split three teams, man. That's it. Yeah, and they're they're just above 500. And, uh, you know, they're, it, it, that'll be a fun race to the end. I'm, I'm curious to see how, how it'll all finish out before all, the All-Star break. Um, New York Mets, nine and a half games behind. Uh, it's so sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'll be interested to see if the, how much they really unload or if this Degrom Syndergaard trade talk is just a bunch of talk. But we'll mm-hmm. see. I'll tell you the one thing out of all of that that stood out to me, and I just was kind of going through it was you know a young team in Philadelphia. They're probably a year ahead of schedule uh, in the rebuild. They're probably looking to jump into this big free agent market this year and really boost their club. But uh, they're 13 and 19 on the road, which is not good. Uh, but who knows? We'll see what happens. They they could make a trade at the deadline to bolster their team to get better as well. I really love Atlanta. I, from the very first episode on the podcast, I was super excited about the Atlanta Braves, and I still am. All I know is if the Nationals don't get it going, man, they're going to be in a dog fight that I don't think they expected to see coming. Yep. What about the NL Central? We got Milwaukee. They are leading the pack here. We got the Cubs and Cardinals. Uh, they're kind of battling out together there. Always do, don't they? Yes. And then Cincinnati's not playing baseball, but <laughs> And then the Pirates are the Pirates are fading and yeah. fading too and they're going to continue to fade. Cincinnati's a triple A team at best. Yeah. I'll tell you what's impressive to me is how good Milwaukee their their uh, bullpen is. Everybody knew they went out and made a you know, they signed a couple guy or yeah, they got Yelich, I think. Uh you know, so they knew that they had gotten the outfielders, they got Lorenzo Kane. But man, that bullpen is is awesome and you know they're they're not slowing down at all we'll see what happens chicago is going to be tough st louis man they just lost one of their players to tommy john surgery too uh and poor that guy uh, reyes i think is his name man i just saw another article his daughter fighting cancer like, oh my a couple God. years old too so very sad my heart goes out to That's him horrible. and the st louis community but you know i'll be interested to see the cubs are going to be there for the long haul they're an experienced team the brewers are a very young team we'll see if they can hang around what do you think dan um, my thoughts are, I hope that it comes down because I'm, I'm Cardinals. I'm not as strong on, yeah. I, I don't see as much. Um, I don't watch as much many games with the Cardinals and, uh, I don't follow them as much. Um, Milwaukee and the Cubs on the other hand, those are two teams I've been following since the beginning. Uh, I was really shocked to see Milwaukee as high up. I, I thought, I thought the Cubs would be, you know, leading the pack for, um, this division, but, uh, I think it's exciting to watch, and I think that towards the end it's going to come down to the Milwaukee and the Cubs going at it. I don't know about the Cardinals. Yeah, um, I think they'll just be middle of the pack probably as well. Yeah. And out west, we got the Diamondbacks, and we got the Dodgers. Dodgers, like I said earlier, a little bit of a streak. They're getting a little better. Things are things are looking a little better for them. Um, Diamondbacks, they've, they've had a pretty good year so far, but you know a couple of their players who started off hot, not so much now. Um, I mean, they're, they're just above a 500 ball, ball club right now, so it's like 
I don't know. I, do you do you see them holding on to this much longer? <laughs> the, the, this this division here. I mean, I know we live on the East Coast and don't get a ton of time on the National League West Coast side of things, but uh, this this division is kind of very uninspiring to me. The Dodgers are a team that has got so much money invested in so many players. They shouldn't. It shouldn't even be close. Yeah. Honestly, even with Kershaw being hurt, they, it shouldn't even be close. So hats off to Arizona for continuing the fight. I wonder if they regret not signing J.D. Martinez in the year he's having in Boston Probably. because he was huge, huge to that team. So, man, poor San Francisco, though. They just get Madison Bumgarner back. They're hanging around. They're in striking distance four games back. I just see today Evan Longoria, broken finger, out indefinitely. Mm-hmm. So that's not good for them. I think everybody in Colorado is probably a little disappointed. But still, they're only four and a half games back. They, and have, hell, a, they have so much talent on that team. I, I'm really shocked that they're not and, and as bad as, And as bad as the Padres supposedly are supposed to be, they're five and a half back. So mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. Baseball is 162 games. And sooner or later, this is going to work itself out. And I don't think the end of the year, five teams are going to be separated by three or five and a half games. That's not just going to happen. But it's just to me, I don't understand why the Dodgers aren't better. And I don't understand why they continue to play this middle of the road baseball. It's kind of, to me, it, it doesn't show signs of a team that's was on the cusp of a world series. Do you think LA is going to be, uh, I'm toward, not sure. Toward, do you think they have any type of promise? I guess uh, it really, after the all-star break, I guess we'll, we'll really see cause yeah. they might turn it up. They, they might not. They have the ammunition to make a big trade and they they don't care about their budget. They really don't. It's obvious. Uh, they're, they're like the new look Yankees of the, of the early two thousands. So, They'll do something to get better, Mm -hmm. but it's just, to me, it's kind of like for a team that was supposedly going to make another run at a World Series, I mean, it's just not not looking good to me. But Arizona's good. I mean, maybe maybe they make a big trade, too, and come after a a guy in Baltimore, and that's what I keep reading about. So we'll see if it happens, and if that does, that, that could really help their team out as well. So hats off to Arizona. They're leading the pack right now. Hopefully they keep it up. All right, and always, as always, give us your thoughts on this. That was the standings. Uh, let us know if you think that we're crazy for thinking what we're thinking. Obviously, we're we're just reading the, the stats here. We have them right in front of us, uh, but you might not agree with our uh, our thought process, on, especially if it's your team. And yeah, especially if it's your team. But you hear us like just shit on our team the entire yeah. episodes. But I mean, the, it's the worst. Base, Orioles baseball team ever. Poor Buck Show Walter. Yeah, my heart goes out to Buck Show Walter. I feel terrible for there, the guy. And we have to we have to bring this up. So we were tagged a couple times today. So there's a bar in Baltimore. Uh, maybe all the bars. They're giving out free shots when Chris Davis gets a hit, and that is just sad, sad, sad. It's terrible. I mean, it's absolutely embarrassing for a guy who's getting paid. 17 million dollars plus all the deferred money that makes it like 22 or 24 million somewhere in there whatever it's a whole lot of money for a guy who can't even pull the trigger and swing the bat so Mm -hmm. poor buck show walter poor baltimore candom yards nation it's it's not going to be good i just hope that they can make the right deals and the right trades to get the team going in the right direction yep all right, guys, give us your thoughts. And uh, that's pretty much going to wrap up the bottom of the ninth segment, unless yeah. you have anything else you want to add there. No, nah, no, no. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll get geared up, get ready for the All-Star break. We'll have to um, make our predictions here, Dan, on who we believe will be each pick an All-Star team maybe here. Yeah. Coming up and share our thoughts on who would, uh, you know, whose team would be better, my team and your team. And maybe you'll just pick a, pick a uh, the NL and I'll pick the AL or vice versa, and we'll, we'll see what happens, see who gets the most picks. Yeah, it's going to be fun either way. Yes, it'll either be exciting. Way. And I did see the MLB wants Bryce Harper in the home run derby, which I think would be good for the game. Yeah. So, and especially I being agree. in D.C. Uh, mm-hmm. for him in the hometown, that would be pretty wild and exciting. Yep, absolutely. All right, so that wraps up this episode, and that's episode 12 now. Um, so With more coming. Yeah. So, um, as always, make sure you follow us on all social media. It's at Going Yard Podcast, and on Twitter, at Going Yard and the number two. Uh, you can find all of our content uh, on iTunes. Uh, like and subscribe to us there. Leave us a five-star review. Uh, you can check us out on SoundCloud, Google Play as well. Uh, and then we also have our Podbean page. Uh, with pictures, videos, and other stuff like that. If you can uh, check that out for us, it'd be awesome. Uh, please uh, find some of the product demos we've had and, and you know check them out. If you like them, buy them as gifts. Give them to a friend, stuff like that. No, anything to help out the, the ball player in your household or the ball player that you know. All right. Well, that's a wrap. 
So for DJ Jewett and Mark Bestman of The Glove Hub, I'm Dan. And I'm Tyler. See ya. Later.